will knock the rust off. Some of them were up late last night drinking in town, so... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Lee's headquarters at Gettysburg Battlefield. Uh, my name is Chris Atkinson, and uh, I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, most of our guys, everyone out here is a volunteer uh, helping out this weekend uh, from all over the U.S., up north, up uh, down south, some places out west, and so forth. And what we're doing here this weekend is we're representing a portion of Lee's artillery here at, at the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, we are betraying Dance's Artillery Battalion. Uh, it was also referred to as a Powhatan Light Artillery out of Powhatan County, Virginia, which is just northwest of Richmond. So everyone you would see here in the battery would be Virginians. They would not actually be engaged on the actions of July 1st, but they would be brought up as reserve artillerists on the night of July 1st. They would actually start taking up a position just uh, about less than a quarter of a mile from our position now along uh, Confederate Avenue. So when they got here, they formed with five other batteries, which consisted of a total of 20 guns uh, in the battery. They had four 20-pound parrots, four 10-pound parrots, 10 three-inch ordnance rifles, and two 12-pound Napoleon smoothbore cannons. And over the course of two days, on July 2nd, and today's anniversary, July 3rd, they would shoot over 1,888 rounds of ammunition in the course of two days. They would also suffer uh, three killed in action and also 19 wounded uh, in their battery by the end of the day on July 3rd. So we have, what we have here representing today is a portion of a full battery. A full Confederate battery during the American Civil War would have consisted of four guns. And that battery would be commanded by a lieutenant. The battery was then divided into two sections with two sections per gun, each section being commanded by a lieutenant, they called a section chief. Also assigned to each section would be a sergeant, a non-commissioned officer, who's referred to as the chief of the peace. He would be responsible under the lieutenant for those two guns in his section. And then, as we work down in rank, we have corporals who serve as gunners. Uh, they're the ones who actually are in charge of each piece and all seven men on their detachment. So the guns that we have out here today are very representative of the guns that were here during the Battle of Gettysburg being used by dances on July 2nd and 3rd. The first gun you see here is closest to you. It's got a three inch ordnance rifle. It's an 1851 model. It's a federal gun. Uh, this would have been a captured gun by the Confederates, a very highly sought after gun. Also in the middle is a 10 pound parrot, which is also here at the Battle of Gettysburg. Also federal made and a very highly sought after gun. The reason they were highly sought after is because they were rifled pieces. They were not smooth bore. 
So when we talk about rifled pieces, this is kind of like the rifled musket. There are lands and grooves which are bore into the barrel of the cannon. What happens is that when the explosion takes place inside the, the cannon, there's metal flanges on the bottom of the projectile. That metal flange will expand under the heat. As it begins traveling through the tube, it'll start to grab those lands and grooves and cause the projectile to spin. The reason for the spin is to actually give your target or be on target to give you greater distance and accuracy. So these two first guns had a good accuracy range of about one mile. So we'll use that barn as a reference, which is to my right, as you see uh, at the end of the field just before the tree line. So we can hit that barn effectively with the first two guns. The third gun is a six pound uh, smoothbore gun. So that means no rifling inside. Um, it had an effective range, maybe a half a mile, maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, but really by time, uh, this time of the war, 1863, a lot of the 12-pounders were being put about out of action because they just weren't as effective uh, for great distance and accuracy. So let's talk a little bit about the different shells, uh, ammunition, uh, that were being used here during the American Civil War in Gettysburg. The first one would have been called bolt. For the smooth bar, <coughs> for the uh, smooth bore, it would have been called solid shot. So bolt. Basically, it looks like this, except it has another flat end, and it's a solid chunk of iron. So if I had enemy in and around that barn to my right, which is a mile away, this is a very good uh, round to use to batter down that building, destroy the building, all right? Also, it's good against enemy fortifications, earthworks, fence posts. As you see here at Gettysburg, lots of uh, stone walls, very effective against that. So more of a battering type of round. The second round is what I'm holding now. It's called shell, also made of iron, but it's hollow inside. And now it's filled with black powder. So again, we have Federals to our front a mile away in that barn, and they're taking up position in that barn. I can catch the barn on fire using shell. I can catch trees on fire. I can catch the field on fire. So it's kind of like an incendiary round. So also it's very scary. Uh, if you hear fireworks and you hear those big mortars go off, uh, that's kind of what it sounds like, uh, but probably double the effect uh, when shell explodes. The third round was called case. It looks exactly like shell, hollow inside, full of, full of black powder, but now it had uh, bits of metal, nails, anything they could find to put in to, to make shrapnel. So as a gunner, the purpose of case is to explode in the air in the front of advancing troops or cavalry so that the forward momentum of the round and the explosion will rain down all the nails, all the bits of metal down on men. So it's a very good anti-personnel and cavalry round. The fourth round would be canister. Canister was a basically the same diameter as this. It looked like a small coffee can made of tin. All right. And inside, it was full of mini balls, lead mini balls, and packed in sawdust. It's a non-explosive round, but what it does do it turns each of these guns into a giant shotgun. The round had an effective range up to 300 yards. Does anyone else know what has an effective range of 300 yards? If I'm facing my enemy. Rifles. Rifle muskets. All right, that means that the enemy is within 300 yards of my position. That means I'm in within range of the rifled muskets, which means my battery, my gun is in danger. My men are in danger, so I may resort to double, double canister. So the purpose of this is to depress the muzzle in the lowest elevation as it will go. As the cannon goes off, all those little mini balls will come out. They will bounce across the ground and the hope was to hit the men of advancing infantry between the knees and the chest area. A lot of accounts during the American Civil War that they knew, the infantry knew when canister was being fired because they could see a rippling effect across the ground it looked like little waves coming from them, and that they would lean into it as they were leaning into a stiff wind. The most devastating round, I could fire a double canister as well to double the effect, if need be, as a gunner. What we're going to do now, we're going to fire again, and then after we do the second firing, I'm going to talk to you about how these men work together, some of the tools and implements they use in order to load and fire each piece. Lieutenant.
I had a little misfire in number two gun. All right, so uh, the full detachment would have consisted of seven men. Uh, they would have been assigned to each piece, and they would have had positions one through seven. Uh, four men would be one position one through four were on the gun. Number five between the gun and the limber chest, and six and seven would have been assigned to the limber chest itself. So all of the men here, uh, they, you have to keep in mind, they all came together from small communities. Uh, they lived in the same towns, the same cities. They attended the same churches. They were neighbors. In a lot of cases, they're also related to each other, unlike the modern army today. If you have a company of, of army today, infantry, uh, they could be from anywhere in the United States. And that system really didn't change up until after World War II. The reason it did change is because of the Civil War, World War I, some portions of World War II, where entire communities were losing all their men because of battles. So that's why they had to uh, start putting men from different areas of the country into each company. But these men worked together, they slept together, they ate together, they drilled together constantly every day. They were cross-trained on each position on what to do. Uh, but it took a certain number of men. Each man on each uh, post position has specific roles and duties and different tools they use to make this gun fire. So we're gonna talk about those right now. Number one. Number one. All right, so number one stands at the right front of the piece, and he's holding an implement called a sponge rammer. On one end is a sponge-like material. It's usually made of sheep or lamb's wool. Underneath the cannon tube itself is a bucket of water called a sponge bucket. So between each firing, he will dump the sponge into the bucket of water. He'll wring off the access, put it into the tube. And the reason we're doing that is because the powder bags are made of cotton, Eisenberg, or flannel. So from there still may be burning embers, piece of this left from a previous firing. So we want to make sure we extinguish everything in the tube before we enter another one pound powder charge. Because that would not be pretty. So it's more of a safety measure. All right, so once a new powder charge and round has been put into the cannon, it'll invert the piece. On the other end is a wooden block. The wooden block is used to seat the round and the powder bag to the breech of the barrel. All right, number two. All right, number two uh, stands at the left front of the piece. He holds an implement called a worm. Another long wooden rod, but on this end, on one end is a uh, two metal prongs. So it's a cleaning tool. So again, between firings, you can use the worm to clean out any residue that may be left because black powder if you shoot it while will begin to, to gunk up inside the tube so we have to keep it clean. It can also be used to extract rounds in case there was a faulty round as well. He's also the person responsible for taking the new powder bag and the new round and putting it into the barrel for number one to ram home. Number three. Right, so number three is uh, the left rear. He has the busiest job on the gun. He has three different Task. On the command load, he's going to step into the piece. On his left thumb is a piece of leather that's wrapped around it. On the top rear of the cannon tube is a vent hole. So he's going to put that leather piece of the vent hole creating a vacuum. 
Does anyone know what fire's best friend is? Air and oxygen, right? So if, they, if number one did not do his job correctly by sponging the tube and extinguishing any flames, you want to make sure no air is passing in and out. So he covers that vent hole. All right, so then he will break to the rear. He'll grab a hold of the trail spike. He'll traverse the piece from left to right at the gunner's discretion in the direction of the enemy or a enemy fortification or target. His last job on command ready is to step into the piece again. Now he has what's called a priming wire. The priming wire goes into the vent hole and punctures the powder bag, exposing the black powder in the charge itself. So he has a busy position. Number four. Number four stands at the, uh, the left rear of the piece. And he's the person that has the funnest job. He makes the gun go off. He makes it go bang. <laughs> so he has on his uh, utility belt a leather pouch. And inside that pouch, he has a bunch of these items called friction primers. These are little brass tubes. They're filled with fine grain black powder. A little wax on one end to keep the powder from falling out. On the other end is a metal pin. Also in this pouch, he has an implement called a lanyard. A long rope has a wooden toggle on one end to hold on to and a metal hook on the other. So he'll put the metal hook on the pin, pull the lanyard taut, on command fire he pulls the lanyard, pulls the pin out quickly, creates a spark, it's a mercury fulminate, and nice the black powder, shooting the flame down the vent hole to the exposed ammunition bag. That's how it goes off. Now, if for some reason I have a bunch of bad friction primers, I can also resort to my lens stop be kept in the ground about five yards to the rear of the gun itself. A piece of lint which is tied to the, uh, the, the stock itself. I would light this on fire. It would burn an ember. So if I had faulty friction primers, I could fill the vent hole with black powder. I could then stand away from the piece just like during the Revolutionary War. I can touch the vent hole, igniting the black powder to shoot down the hole. So the backup mode. Number five. All right, so we don't have a six and seven today, so number five is running our ammunition from the chest. That's his main responsibility, is to take the ammunition and black powder charges from the limber chest to number two for loading. To do that, he's wearing a leather haversack called a gunner's haversack. That's to protect the round and the powder charge as it's going to the cannon. You can imagine during the field of fire, they're burning embers and flames everywhere, so he doesn't want to carry in his hand a pound of black powder. So it could be very dangerous. So he uses that gunner haversack to protect the ground. Six and seven would be on the limber chest itself. They're responsible for setting or cutting the fuses for each round. To do that, they have what's called a table of fire chart. It's glued underneath the lid of the limber chest, kind of like a period calculator. So based on time, distance, and flight, they know how to either set or cut each fuse properly. The last position is the gunner. As I mentioned before, he's a corporal, he's not a number position, uh, but he's in, charge, he's in charge of each gun and responsible for the safety and security for each of the members on the detachment. Behind the limber chest, you would have caissons assigned to each gun. Caissons look just like a limber, except it has four wheels and two ammunition chests. And those two limbers, I'm sorry, the caissons would feed the limbers and the limbers feed the gun. All right, so that's how they went off. What we're going to do, we're going to have one last firing uh, demonstration for you. Once we make the guns clear and safe, you're welcome to come over, take a closer look at the guns, ask the cannoneers any questions, uh, take pictures, whatever you want to do. We'll sign autographs as well. <laughs> I know Martha wants my autograph, right? So uh, that's a joke. But uh, we really appreciate y'all coming out here today. It means a lot to us. Thank you very much. All right, Lieutenant.